Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Trinity Assembly of God. This is Sunday morning, and we're looking forward to sharing a word from the Lord that we believe will challenge you and edify you, build you up in the things of Jesus Christ. We do want to mention that next week we'll be back in-house uh, with live services on the 27th at 10 a.m. So we want to invite everybody to come and be a part of next week's service. And um, we, we know the Lord is going to be here in a mighty and in a powerful way. Uh, we're going to take a little pause and we're going to share a couple of songs with you. Uh, and so just let them bless your heart. And then we're going to get into the word. I sing praises to you, Lord.
pray that uh, those songs ministered to your heart. Now that second chorus that we sang, uh, to him who sits on the throne, kind of paves the way for our text today. As I've been praying, the Lord laid this upon my heart. This passage of scripture from Hebrews chapter one, verses eight and nine. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness about thy fellows. I want to talk to you today about Jesus in his throne, thy throne, O God. Father, take this passage of scripture and unfold it to us and help us to grasp some truths that are us for the days ahead and put wind in our sail and excitement in our soul about the prospect of the return of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray it, I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thy throne, O God. Now we mentioned a couple of Wednesdays ago that we're coming to the end of an age. It's the end of human governance. The end of human government upon earth, and it's gonna collimate in a one world order, a one world government. Uh, the famed historian Toynbee said way back in 1955, he said that he made a statement that he announced that it was time for the world government to come. The world government and the world church will be concurrent prophetic realities. They uh, can be seen widely in our day and age. It's time for the world government to come. And you know, the struggle that's going on politically, the battle in the U.S. for power in this political cycle is nothing but a part of that. Uh, we realize and understand that it's the human government trying to cling to power, but Jesus Christ is going to come and set up his rightful governance on planet Earth. And so there's this power struggle in the U.S. Benjamin Franklin said this long ago, he who shall introduce into public affairs the principles of primitive Christianity will change the face of our world. How far different from the politics of this day. George Washington famously said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God in the Bible. And Andrew Jackson made the statement, the Bible is the rock upon which our republic rests. But you know and understand that there's an all-out assault against Christianity, against God, against the Bible, trying to eradicate all of them from society. And that's the reason why we need to vote. And we need to be focused on that in a certain degree. We know in the interim between this election and the coming of the Lord, there's going to be another world war, World War III. The, the sixth trumpet of Revelation chapter nine is gonna be the worst war the world has ever known. We know right now, dominant in the news headlines is Middle East peace as two Arab nations have signed peace agreements and are now trading diplomats with Israel. And they're predicting that many others are going to join. Right now, we have the 113th Pope, that prophesied Pope from the Catholic Church that uh, we believe will be the false prophet of the last days. It'll culminate with the Antichrist and with Armageddon. Uh, but I've got news for you. This rule of man, the government of man, human government, friends, is not going to go out with a bang. It's going to go out with a breath. Now understand the beginning of man's rule started with God breathing. The Bible says in Genesis 2 and 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, a living being. God breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam. And Adam was given dominion, given rule over the earth. And God's image was reflected in Adam, but Adam fell. Adam marred the image of God. 
And so as a result, it's been fallen man ever since this made a debacle of government. But what began with the breath of God is going to end with the breath of God. Because the Bible says in Psalm 18, verse 15, then the channels of the sea were seen, the foundations of the world were uncovered. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. God's breath into the nostrils of Adam created man and created man's dominion on earth. And it will be the breath of God that's going to bring destruction to the rule of man. Friends, it's not going to be a battle in the battle of Armageddon. It's not going to be a situation where you've got the armies of the world in full array coming against Jesus Christ, and there's a battle ensuing. All the armies will gather, and they'll brag and they'll boast what they're going to do to Jesus at the very end. And Jesus' response to all of their bragging is simply going to be this. Hmm. Hmm. And it's over. But with the righteousness... He shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. There'll be no battle. It'll be over in an instant. Jesus Christ will rule and reign. So we've got to look past the current situation. We've got to look past what lies directly ahead beyond it. Because the Bible says in Psalm 8 verse 6, Talking about the Father, you have made him, Christ, to have dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. God's plan, his purpose, and his intention is for Jesus to rule and reign. But the rule of man is going to go down hard. It's going to go down tooth and toenail. And that's why we see the havoc and the chaos, and we see the destruction going on in our world today. So from this passage of scripture, I want you to see seven things about Jesus Christ. First of all, I want you to see the sovereignty of Christ, thy throne. Now all I'm going to do to point out the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, his throne, is read the second song. Just allow me to read it to you. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's Christ, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I, God says, will declare the decree of the Lord has said unto me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You see the sovereignty of Jesus Christ here in Hebrews chapter one, thy throne. Friends, Jesus is the king of kings. Jesus is the Lord of lords. And one day he is going to rule undisputed. We may have a potential disputed election coming up in the day's end, but there'll be no disputing Jesus' rule as king and Lord in this world. We've got to look past and beyond what's right before us to what's coming in right behind it, friends. You see the sovereignty of Jesus, thy throne. You see the deity of Jesus. Oh God, thy throne, oh God. Now do you realize that Jesus Christ was not crucified for what he did? He was crucified for who he was. He was crucified for his identity. Now all through the scriptures you can find examples and instances of the deity of Jesus Christ. When it spoke of Jesus being born of a virgin and what his name should be called, among the names he was to be called the mighty God. And it was, uh, of course, Thomas who, when he saw the risen Savior, and he reached over and touched the nails in his hands and touched uh, the, the scar that was in his side, the scars in his hand and in his side, and he declared, my Lord and my 
God. They crucified Jesus because he claimed equality with God and they crucified him for blasphemy, the deity of Jesus Christ. He was not created by God. He is God. Oh God, oh God, the sovereignty of Christ, thy throne, the deity of Christ. Oh God, you have the dynasty of Christ. It's forever and ever. Now I remember reading just last week of Joe Kennedy, Joseph Kennedy III's loss in the Massachusetts primary. Now he's the great nephew of JFK. And as you know, the administration of John F. Kennedy was referred to as Camelot. That was uh, Jacqueline Kennedy's description of it, uh, pointing to King Arthur's court. The 1,000-day presidency of JFK was called Camelot. And many believe last week, for the first time, a Kennedy lost an election in the state of Massachusetts. It was the end of Camelot. Well, whether it was a, a thousand day administration or it was a, a reign of some 60 years way back into the 60s. Friends, listen to me. It's short. It's short. I think about uh, the Bush dynasty, as many people refer to it. You have Bush 41, who was a one term president, four years. And then you have Bush 43, who was a two term president. He was the president for two terms or eight years. And then Jeb just didn't jive with the people. It was an effort for a third Bush to be president. And he never made it through the primaries. And so you have uh, that uh, dynasty, so to speak. You look at the various dynasties in history. There was the Ming dynasty. It lasted for 276 years. There was a Zua dynasty. It lasted for over 800 years. There were 37 Roman empires that ruled this world for 1,480 years, friends. 1,480 years. But what is that compared to Jesus? We know that during the time of the Roman Empire, Christ was born. And now we no longer look at time the same way. Time was divided at the very birth of Jesus. We have B.C. or before Christ, and we have A.D. or Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. Time itself is divided by the birth of a child, the son of the living God. And his kingdom, the dynasty, is going to be timeless. It's going to be endless. It's going to be everlasting. Here in the book of Hebrews, it says it's forever and ever. Now Psalm 145 and verse 13 says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. There's a fight for four-year term coming up. There's some fights for four-year terms in the Senate, some fights for two-year terms in the Congress. But I'm telling you, there's coming a term that will never end when Jesus Christ comes. That dominion will endure throughout all generations. The everlasting kingdom of Jesus Christ. And the children of God can say amen to that. You've got the sovereignty and the deity and the dynasty of Jesus Christ. That is what is just ahead for you and I. He's going to come rule and reign for 1,000 years and from that point throughout all eternity. The sovereignty, deity, the dynasty. You've got the authority of Christ here in the scripture. It speaks of the scepter. The scepter. Now this is taken from Psalm 45. Now a scepter was a staff. Uh, that was held by a sovereign as an emblem of their authority. It was called a diadem uh, or a scepter. And it spoke of the extent of their rule or their realm, so to speak. I was doing a little study and found that the largest empire in history, as far as landmass was concerned, was the British Empire. At one point, the British Empire ruled 22.63% almost 23% of the total land mass on earth. By far the largest dynasty, the largest authority 
spread in the world. Some other uh, different dynasties and ruled empires were the Mongolian, 9.27 uh, million miles. The British, as we said, was 13.71 million miles, square miles. The Russian Empire, 8.8 .8 million square miles. The Macedonian Empire, 2.1 million. The Roman Empire, 1.93 million square miles, almost 2 million square miles to the Roman Empire. But I've got news for you, friends. There's 196,900,000 square miles on the surface of the earth. And Jesus is going to rule and reign over every single square mile. Bible says the heaven is his throne and the earth, the earth is going to be his footstool. He'll rule and reign planet earth. Psalm 72 in verse 8. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. There's coming a day Jesus is going to rule the entire planet. And those who trust him, those who put their faith in him, those who follow him are going to rule and reign with him. So take encouragement, friends, from that. You've got the authority of Christ. You've got the length of it. You've got the breadth of his throne. Jesus Christ, his sovereignty, his deity, dynasty, his authority, his integrity. It says he'll rule in righteousness. He loved righteousness. Now, in Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 1, it says, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule with justice. We hear cries in the streets of injustice today, and there is plenty of injustice to go around. We have a divided nation, but just about on every side there are injustices of various sorts. And people are screaming out and crying out and turning to violence uh, in some sort of a crazy effort to bring about justice using injustice to try and bring about justice. But there is a king who loves righteousness and a king who loves justice, that when he comes, his integrity will come through, his righteousness will come through, his moral law will be established. Now the king will rule by law, and the Lord rules by a law, and that law is the moral law. And the moral law, let me break it down for you, it's 10 commandments, there are two tablets of stone, five Godward, five manward. And then those two tablets of stone were broken in two great commandments. Jesus said, the whole law is fulfilled in two great commandments. Love God first, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. In fact, uh, it was Paul who went on in the fifth of Galatians and the seventh of Romans and said, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. And that one word is a four-letter word, friends. And that four-letter word is love. Jesus will rule in his integrity, will show forth it in the justice and the righteousness and the rule by which he will reign. And that is the rule of love, the law of love. Love will fill the earth. I look forward to that day. It's coming at an end to the chaos of human government. Jesus is coming to set up his law of love. Immanuel Kant, the famed theologian, uh, said that he was awed by just two things. Let me quote, amidst all my doubts and speculations, there are two things which always strike me with awe, the starry firmament above me and the moral law within me. Immanuel Kant couldn't deny the stars in the heavens that speak of the existence of God and the moral law that God had written into his heart. And he's written to all of our hearts. And one day he's going to write it into our consciences and into our spirits and rule the world by that moral law, the authority of Christ, the integrity of Christ. There is the spirituality of Christ because it says God has anointed him. He has been anointed. Now, Many of you know that the word Christ means anointed. In the Greek, it's Christos, the anointed of the Lord. And that means to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. 
And the Bible tells us, speaking of Jesus, and we quoted this Wednesday night in our study in Isaiah 61 and verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach glad tidings. Jesus quoted that scripture concerning himself. The Spirit of God is the one who anoints, and Christ was anointed by the Spirit. When he came up out of the water, he was, he was born of the Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit planted the seed into the womb of that virgin. And then when Jesus was baptized publicly, the Holy Spirit descended upon him visibly. Jesus, the anointed of God. The Bible says in Acts 10, 38, how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now that word anointed, that word Christ, that word Christos, really speaks of the threefold office of Jesus, a prophet, priest, and king. He was anointed as prophet, God's spokesman. Remember, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach. As a prophet, Jesus was God's spokesman. And as a priest, he was God's sacrifice. Only he was a priest that didn't offer a lamb. He became the lamb himself and he offered himself as a sacrifice. As a king, he was God's sovereign, anointed to be king. And there's a spirituality that's coming with the rule and reign of Jesus. Again, it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that's going to earmark his rule on planet Earth. You just see how that anointing worked that anointing worth when he was here in the days of his flesh, going about doing good. There's going to be good being done everywhere as the anointing of the Lord fills the earth. Then healing all who are oppressed, not just physical healings, but people who are mentally and emotionally fractured. There's going to be healing of people who are oppressed and depressed. And the Bible says that God was with him and God the Father will be with Christ and the anointing of the Holy Spirit will be upon him. It will be a spiritual reign. You see the spirituality of Christ, that God had anointed him right here from Hebrews chapter one, verse eight. The sovereignty, the deity, the dynasty, the authority, friends, the integrity, the spirituality, and the vivacity of Christ because he was anointed with the oil of gladness, the vivacity of Christ. The word vivacity simply means energy. It means exuberance. It means a cheerfulness. It means to be animated. Friends, the Bible speaks of the coming of Jesus Christ and the vivacity of his coming, even in nature. Listen to Isaiah 55, one and two. I'm reading from the New International Version. For you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. When Jesus Christ comes, this whole creation, which right now is groaning for the manifestation of the Son of God, when he comes, when he is manifested, all the children of God are then manifest that mountains, the Bible says, are going to burst into song and the trees are going to clap their hands. And I have no reason to believe that this isn't literally to be taken literally, not just figuratively. I believe that all the creation cries out for the Lord's return. Listen to another verse in Isaiah 44. Verses 21 through 23. Remember these things, Jacob. Remember these things, Israel. Sing for joy, you heavens, uh, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, you earth beneath. Burst into song, you mountains, you forests and all you trees, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob and displays his glory in Israel. Hallelujah. Right when Israel's on the brink at the end of human government, when the Antichrist and the armies of the north, when Russia, Gog and Magog, and those northern armies come down to Israel, march through all the way to the Temple Mount, then Jesus is coming forth and with a single breath, he's going to put an end to human government and he's going to restore Jacob and restore Israel. 
to their rightful place, ruled and reigned in a new Jerusalem, friends. We won't be ruling from the parliament in, in, in London any longer. The, the biggest, uh, largest, uh, most uh, accumulated landmass British Empire it isn't going to be from the citadels of Congress. It's not going to be from the Oval Office, friends. It's going to rule and reign from the New Jerusalem, friends. And there's going to be a vivacity to it, such a joy that uh, accompanies this, that all of creation is going to become animated, friends. We say, well, you know, I'm just not wired that way. I just kind of geared to being a little shy and being a little reserved, and I understand that. People are wired differently, but I've got news for you, friends. If you get enough of the joy of the Lord, if you will be anointed with the oil of gladness, friends, you'll get animated too. It'll animate your hands. You'll want to give the Lord wave offerings. You'll want to clap unto the Lord. It'll animate your feet. It'll get into your feet. It'll make you burst forth and dance. It'll make you want to bust the move for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It'll get in your hands. It'll get in your feet. It'll get into your mouth. You want to shout forth God's praises when you think of the prospect of his return. And how wonderful, beyond description, it's going to be, friends. That's what you and I, as children of God, have to look forward to. All of those who are the redeemed of the Lord. All of those who are saved. All of those who are born again. We'll experience it, friends. Be a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. And the joy of the Lord is our strength, literally our energy. It energizes us. And what energy, what exuberance, what cheerfulness, what animation we're going to witness when Jesus Christ comes. I think it was an old little old lady in the hills of Tennessee uh, who heard about the rocks crying out. If the people will praise, Jesus said, if they will praise me, the rocks and mountains will cry out. She said, as long as there's breath in my body, ain't no rock going to do my shout. Friends, I'm going to shout for joy. I'm going to lift my hands unashamedly. I'm going to dance and leap and praise for the prospect of the coming of Jesus Christ. I'm not all bummed out. I'm not all worried. I'm not fearful. I'm not fretful. I'm not pacing the floor over the things that are happening in our world right now because I can see right through what's happening. It's the end of human government. And it's going to be the establishment of Christ's eternal government. Now let me close with a very simple thought. And I want you to lean in just for a moment as I wrap these thoughts up. The Bible says in Romans 14 and 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God, this very kingdom we're talking about. You could experience right here. You could experience it right now. You don't have to wait till Jesus breaks through the blue. You don't have to wait till he comes like a bolt out of the blue. As the lightning striking even from the east to the west. Uh, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. But you can experience it right now where you are. It's a righteousness. It's a peace. It's a joy. It's not eating and drinking. It's not what you have to eat, what you have to drink, or have to wear, or have to drive, or have to live in. It's not materialism. But it's something deep down within, in the very depths of your soul. It goes far deeper than materialism. It goes far deeper than anything that this world can offer you. And it's a joy that is in spite of your outward circumstances or situation. Jesus said, my uh, joy I will give to you. My peace I will give to you. He said, my love I will give to you in the Gospel of John. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And you can have that right now where you are if you surrender to his kingship. If you simply surrender to his lordship. If you become a subject in his kingdom. A loyal subject to the king. Because... Jesus said himself in Luke 17, 21, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Now he's coming back phys physically. He's coming back literally. He's coming back visibly. Just as he went away in the clouds, he's coming back in the clouds of glory. And every eye will behold him. Every eye will see him. But friends, listen, he can establish his kingdom right now, right where you're living, right in the very center of your heart, right on the throne of your heart. But you gotta open that heart to him. And I'm gonna encourage you to do that right now. 
I'm going to encourage you, those that may be watching, that you're not engaged in Christianity. Maybe you're not going to church. You don't make any profession of faith. I ask you to do that right now. And let the joy of Jesus flood your heart, the vivacity of his rule and reign. Fill your heart with a joy unspeakable, full of glory. You may be going to church, but you're experiencing anything but joy. Uh, you don't have that exuberance. You don't have that excitement and that enthusiasm of that life throbbing in you, that joy unspeakable in your heart. It's because there are things perhaps that have not been surrendered to him. Surrender them today. Surrender it all. Give Jesus your all. Remember, he is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. If he's not Lord of everything, he's Lord of nothing. Understand that. Give him your heart. Give him your everything. Give him your all. Uh, if you make Jesus your Lord today, you can vary in the song. We used to sing an old song, What a Day That Will Be, When My Jesus I Shall See. But you can change that. What a day this will be if you will receive Jesus today into your heart. Now I'm going to encourage you to do that. I'm going to offer a prayer. And then we're going to end with a little song it's simply titled A Crown of Thorns. Listen to these words and realize the price Jesus paid for your salvation. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'll take these words that we've shared, these words about Jesus, seven words about the Christ that is coming and his rule and his reign. Let that rule and reign be a reality in every one of our hearts, every single listener's heart, God. Father, I pray, God, take this song and use it to further minister to them. And when you're through listening to the song, you help us spread the gospel by sharing this, these messages on Facebook with your friends. All right, again, next week we'll be back here in the auditorium for live services, 10 o'clock. I look forward to seeing everyone then. God bless you.